Hey, you're listening to a Bible Bro Down podcast, a member of the Trinity Commission. This is where brothers come together to sharpen one another so we can rightly divide the Word of God. I'm Matt. And this is Billy. And today we are not... So I think last week we talked about doing a Q&A kind of episode because it's been, I don't know, like nine months, ten months since we did one. Um, and we have had a lot of emails over the past uh, ten months, whenever it was, and a couple of them stood out. Uh, not that they're not all uh, important, but some of them, you know, just quick questions we answer, and, and uh, some of them not are so much. <laughs> very long <laughs> conversations that we've had. Yeah, we had um, one that went like 35 messages, back, emails back and forth, and some of those are quite long. Yeah, by the end, uh, I think his one of his was 1,400 to me, and I my response back was uh, close to 2000 words. It just, you know, the longer the conversation goes, the longer your responses get and the more topics are thrown in on top of each other. So it's just, it just happens. What I find though is so nice is that we have written so much out on our website that we can just reference those first. <laughs> kind of like, um, Leighton always says, Hey, I get lots of emails and questions. Check the website first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we have, so much on there um and and, and i think i will say this little disclaimer to everything that's on the website over time we have had some of our positions evolve slightly um not that we disagree with anything we wrote uh at its core but the way we would explain it now is different in certain circumstances we're actually going to talk about one of those here in a few minutes but um if you do get over there and you read something you're like that doesn't sound like what they said in an episode uh you can just shoot us an email and then you know that'll be a clue for us to go maybe update that article or or whatever or we can explain why what we're saying in both places means the same thing um but you know yeah we're not static in our thoughts or beliefs we don't hold to a particular denomination we don't hold to a particular um faith and message covenant whatever you want to call it catechism um we we continue to renew our minds simper reformanda we just keep reforming, keep keep re-understanding. <clears throat> so, uh, do you want to jump right into the the deep one from Mike, or do you want to start with an easier one? Maybe one. Uh, we could start with an easy one. What you got? Uh, well, let's. Get, we have one from Lonnie, and he was basically asking us about the the gap theory. Um, and just to throw that throw it out there first, we want to let people make sure people know that. The gap theory is a theory. It's just a a way of interpreting um, Genesis. And uh, for us, it's this is not a a dogmatic thing. It's not a uh, anyone who doesn't believe this is stupid thing. (laughs) This is this is something that what we see this uh, tends to answer it. it, For first of all, it, it we see how Scripture can teach this. This isn't one one where we believe in evolution or we believed in a long, young, uh, uh, an old earth. So we wanted to find a way to make that fit, you know, with the Bible. This was like, hey, you know, we were both young earth people um, prior to this. I think Matt was, weren't you? Probably. Um, and and we came to study this and uh, alter our view. And for us, it it it, it made more sense. It, it fit more with scripture. It explained all sorts of other you know, questions that we had in other passages. Um, so just to throw that there, that's that's first and foremost. Um, but his question was basically, well, well, hold, go ahead. Hold on real quick. So, And in case you don't know what gap theory is, it's it's positing that between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2, where you find that God created the heavens and the earth, and then the earth was formless and void, and the spirits hovering over the water, and there's this judgment language, something happened between those. Uh, we base it off of, I'm not going to do the whole thing, but we base it off of uh, several other passages uh, in Isaiah and, and Job and elsewhere that talk about the earth uh, being created uh, not formless and void. And yet we find it formless and void in Genesis 1, 2. And so the que- the question is, what happened? And it, it really, it's a convenient thing for us. It, um, it, ex- it gives a timeline for, uh, as opposed to the young earth theory, it gives a timeline for when the fall of the angels was. It gives a timeline for, or it gives kind of an idea of, um, or, uh, an idea, not necessarily. It, it, it leaves some leeway. Um, for us to say, okay, well, there, th- there could have been things happening on Earth prior to the six-day account that we're giving of human cre- creation. Um, but prior to that human creation, it sounds like there was a judgment of some kind with water that the Holy Spirit is looking at um, between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. Yeah, what was that? Not over. sure. 
but it could right. be it it yeah, allows for an old earth and yet a young human creation or human history um but again like you said it, we're not 100 percent on it we're not going to really fight over it if you are interested in it we do have uh, a, a study out there on our on our website on, on the gap theory and a full episode yes that's right we do have an episode um so question um should i just read number one how, sure. how, do, how do we want to do this uh so this basically he has a question he, so this is uh, somebody who had read our view of it and also read some others and basically had a few questions regarding it um it says he says there would be parallels between earth's pre-creation story judgment by water noah's flood and our earth's judgment by fire in Noah's flood, it appears nobody and nothing from the pre-flood world survived except righteous Noah and his family. We also know that heaven and earth will pass away with nothing surviving except those covered by grace. How is it Satan would have survived the gap judgment? Would not have an analog of pure evil escaping God's judgment in the flood or end of day? So basically he's saying, so we have, if, if, because the gap theory basically says that there was a, uh, God basically judged the universe prior to, um, mankind and, and that was when the angels fell and he judged the universe he he um basically covered the cosmos in water and darkness as a sign of judgment so he's saying well how how did how did the angels survive that how did they not quote unquote get destroyed etc because we see something similar happened with noah and we also know in the future the same thing is going to happen yeah it, yeah it's a question of a uh, of kind of shadows right um does the if if it doesn't seem like there is some pure evil that existed through the flood of Noah, then why should we assume that there was some kind of uh, water judgment prior to creation, prior to human creation, uh, in which a fallen creature survived? And so I feel like the response wasn't. I don't know. It seemed uh, pretty common sense looking back at it that and that when we have. Um, Eight fallen people. So uh, Satan fell, according to Gap Theory. There was a judgment, and he and the fallen angels still exist. They're out there. Um, in the Noe, in the Noahic story, we have Noah, his wife, his three sons, their three wives, all surviving. And while they aren't, you know, quote unquote, pure evil, they aren't uh, Satan level. They are still fallen. And so uh, I do make an argument in a study that I wrote. Uh, contrasting judgments by water from judgments by fire judgments by water cleanse uh the earth they cleanse an area but they don't necessarily purify it so it's like um when you're sick and you get a drug to help uh ease the symptoms you, it makes you feel better it may not necessarily be curing you but it's easing this and it's it's calming everything down that's what the the water judgments seem to be doing in scripture Versus the fire judgment, which uh, wipes everything out, it is cleansing. It is like a um, like a crucible, purifying everything, so that there is no impurities anymore. There is Left, no right. righteousness. Yeah, after the fact. So, um, yeah, Satan survived. Possibly, if the gap theory is true, Satan survived that judgment, just like Adam. I mean, not Adam. Noah and his family survived the the Noahic judgment. Um, both fallen. Both continued on the the unrighteousness still remains because um, the fire judgment hasn't happened yet. That purifies all of it. Right. The eternal fire. Yep. Second Peter, uh, second Peter three. So mm -hmm. remember that. Yeah. Right. Um, he continues on uh, basically regarding about, so there's a passage, uh, where is it? Is it in Isaiah? I think it's in Isaiah. There's a passage that says, that, you know, I did not create the earth to be formless and void. You know, but right. to, but to be inhabited, and his question is relating to that. He said, under the more traditional young Earth theory, the Earth was briefly uninhabited between the time God created Earth and Creation Day One. Under Gap theory, the Earth was still uninhabited before Creation Day One, when its prior inhabitants were judged. But if we say the Earth must have been inhabited immediately upon Creation because God made it to be inhabited, then how can we be okay with the Earth being uninhabited at any point thereafter? Under Gap theory, it's okay for the Earth to be uninhabited at some point after it was recreated just not immediately when it was created. I'm struggling with that one. So basically saying, you know, if God created the earth to be inhabited, um, we have God creating the earth in Genesis 1, and there's like six days before, or I guess a day before it's not inhabited. So I think people would understand the question. Yeah, it, yeah. It's basically saying, do we have to apply what is said, I think it is in Isaiah, um, about the earth 
being created to be inhabited? Do we have to apply that to every step of the process? Or is it, is that a statement about the finished product, which would be on the seventh day when he rested? Um, and r really, for this question that you just read, and for the next one, he had three. I kind of just agreed with him. I mean, yes, that, that is a possibility. Um, that statement could be saying, after the fact, once everything was done and he rested, that's what Isaiah is saying was created to be uh, inhabited. Um, there's problems, though, or there could be problems with Genesis 1-1 and whether or not you look at that as a summary or um, or as a... Uh, as a summary of the things that are about to be explained, God created the, the heavens and the earth. Um, and then he's going to re-explain like how he did it in the next, in the following chapters. I mean, excuse me, following verses to the rest of chapter one. Um, or if it's a standalone statement, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, something happened. And, and at the time it was created to be inhabited, 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 <laughs> inhabited. Um, uh, and then something happened and it left it formless and void. And the, the, the Hebrew words there, tohu, uh, wabohu, right. are often associated with judgment. Water is associated with judgment. And uh, again, there are explanations for that, that maybe that's where we pull judgment language from instead of uh, like looking at pre anything world. Whenever something is judged later on, we say it's like that before there was anything else. God just wiped it all out. And now it's like it was before God created. Um, so yeah, it, it, the language is, uh, is a little tricky there. It, it's hard to know for sure what way to go with it, which is why we're not 100% sold right. on it. Um, it's just convenient apologetic, which I have used. Right. I think, I think with, um, the gap theory it would be that you know in, in in the beginning beginning right when god created the heavens and the earth like in genesis 1 1 it would have been perfect right and ready to be inhabited and god would have created the angels and god is always um when you look at scripture god always wants to um have fellowship with his creation with his creatures which is you know why when adam and eve were on the earth he was walking with them in the garden um this the, the same thing is is posited with the angels and god that they would have been in the universe on the earth together until the fall happened and then god judged the universe and he moved to paradise or heaven you know that's where he is presently still um so that's the posit that he, he would have created it you know just in an instant it would have all been perfectly ready for and ha for habitation to be inhabited word and i think his third one I, I think we basically just answered his third question as well uh and we did we responded to him in writing but um yeah we're just going through it again uh, God says on creation day six, you created male and female and called the whole of his creation very good. But then in Genesis 2, 18, God made male first, but it was not good for man to be alone. So the Bible does seem to have precedent in the creation story for God being in the middle of making something good. My question is, is it necessary to say God created the earth to be inhabited? Therefore, God created the earth to be inhabited immediately. Yeah, there's room for either of those. Right. So, and, and I apologize to him. I said, look, I, I really just agreed with everything you just said. Um, uh, yes, there is room for um, understanding that the inhabited or, or got something being good is after the fact. Um, yeah, I, you know, honestly, I, again, the reason I, why I like the gap theory is because it's just a it's convenient for when you're talking to someone and they say, I just don't buy this, this young earth thing, 6,000 years, we've got so many different, um, uh, signs around us saying that it's much, much older than that. The universe is much, much older. Um, and yet you're demanding that it's 6,000 years. And while a young earth creationist might say, uh, God created the world to, uh, in a mature state, he didn't start it from bubbling lava and then cool it off and then wait for things to, you know, I mean, he just, he started it at a certain point and we're just seeing that. So if you find zircon crystals or something that, you know, it's a closed system and, and the radiation is, is measurable and it looks like it's a million years old. Well, that's because he put it there, um, in that state because he wanted to create an earth or he wanted to start with an earth that's a million years old. Just like a, an author doesn't start his book with in the beginning, God, an author starts his book with a setting. And so that's what God did. He picked a setting and then he created, um, uh, but still, if that doesn't, that doesn't uh, satisfy you and you, you still think, you know, what about an old earth option? 
Old Earth is still an option too. There's the gap theory, which is an option. It, it allows for a very old Earth. Or there are other Christian explanations for an old Earth that are completely um, orthodox, I should say. Right. And, I th- yeah. I think uh, Dr. Hunter, Braxton Hunter, uh, is old Earth, but doesn't believe in the gap theory. I've actually not heard him explain his view. Have you? I haven't, but I, I think you're right. He and Jonathan are both... Uh, I think they're old Earth, but neither one of them they know of the gap theory, but I don't think they favor it. Right. Um. It, but again, that's that's okay. We, we don't know. Nobody. And that means we hate there. each other because you know we Christians can't disagree on something and still like each other. Well, I mean, we don't hate them. We just we do insult them regularly. But that's about <laughs> it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, that was we we I gotta say I loved getting those questions from Lonnie because it was just something different. Like you know we hadn't. We spend so much time focused on soteriology and, and Calvinism in particular, uh, and we're going to get there today. Um, and it, not that those are bad things. We realize that's just kind of the uh, the n- niche that we've kind of carved out for ourselves at the moment. Um, but getting something different like this was just uh, kind of a refreshing breeze, you know? Mm-hmm. I think we should go for another easy one because I think the, the last one. Because there's multiple questions. It's, it's going to take a while. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they relate. This next one and the last one relate. So Yeah. Um, so we got a, a, a an email from Marsha. And she said, I've shared with my daughter the view that I've come to believe. Now she is struggling with the idea of her children's salvation. Would killing them before the age of accountability not be the best way to ensure their salvation? Uh, then abortion, too, would actually be merciful because they will be saved and the parent will suffer for a while under God's wrath, but then be annihilated. To be clear, she's not promoting those ideas. She's saying this is a, a question that her daughter threw her way. So she's just... It's just a logical <laughs> conclusion kind of thing. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Uh, you want to jump on it first? So there's two ways to look at this. Um, so let's say you are an unbelieving adult and you know of God and you've basically thrown yourself saying, you know, I'm not good enough kind of thing. I want to continue to do what I want to do kind of thing. Um, But I want my children to go to heaven. So an unbeliever could, you know, go this route of of abortion or killing children before a certain age, you know, in in order to quote unquote ensure they're going to be in heaven kind of thing. All right. (laughs) I'm already going to be judged anyway. So that kind of thing. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, I don't think an unbeliever would would actually believe that their children's salvation is at risk right. because they wouldn't believe in salvation in the first place. But well, I'm talking about you know, there's there's people who suppress the truth, right? But don't suppress all of the truth. They still have you know, they believe God, but they just want to live their own way. You know what I mean? Look yeah, at the and, look at the um, uh, the rich young ruler, right? Believe God, but just wasn't willing to do certain things. <laughs> yeah. Um, this does, oh, we will say this does presuppose that the, that children are born under grace. We'll get more into that, uh, with the next question, but yeah. Um, so how, how do you answer someone who says, well, if you think that all children are saved, why are you, why are you against abortion? And, uh, a pretty, you know, kind of duh answer is because God hates death <laughs> and uh, he said, don't murder. And that's what, that's what abortion is. Um, Billy, is it, is it? better to live for God and to serve him and to produce fruit than it is to, uh, unfortunately die young and still be under grace in, in his mercy, but not benefit from all of those blessings. Ha- if you had produced fruit. Right. I think Paul kind of asked this question too, doesn't he, you know, to, he could die and go be with Christ, but he wanted to serve God faithfully. And, you know, he knew that in serving God, that God had also promised reward, not just eternal life, right, but additional rewards God promises to us. Um, and you can see that in various parables, you know, this that, you know, God gives you certain gifts, and if you do those, then you're going to be in charge of ten cities or five cities or two cities. So there's definitely rewards in heaven for serving God faithfully on this earth. So um, there is a benefit to, to living for God here. Yeah, uh, ju- it's uh, it re- this question reminds me of Romans six, um, and I don't think I put this in the response, but I just thought it. it Paul says, uh, "You may ask, should we go on sinning so that grace may abound?" No, <laughs> don't do that. Um, just because you, you're certain that uh, your child is under the grace of God, 
uh, doesn't mean you should you should make sure their life ends. That's like a Christian saying, okay, I'm like 90% sure that I'm saved at the moment. I'm going to go ahead and take too many sleeping pills. That way I die in this state just in case I can lose my salvation later. I'm going to go ahead and lock it in now. Right. No, <laughs> that that's still murder or that's still uh, a sin against God and that's not acceptable. The goal is he's purchased everybody so that we could serve him. And Billy's got like a bajillion verses that say exactly that. He's purchased us so that we can serve him. And as parents, we should raise our kids so that they could serve him. Give them the option to uh, to cling to him or not. But um, Right. You, yeah, you look no. at you look at Moses and the Exodus, right? I free my people so they can serve me. Free my people so they can mm-hmm. serve me. And what what what's the language that God uses? You know, I purchased you out of Egypt. I freed you from bondage. I freed you from slavery. All so you could serve me. And then later on, while they're in the wilderness, you know, having been freed to to serve God in faith, He says, uh, you know, they 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 went back to their bondage. They appointed leaders and went back to their bondage. So obviously, what He did for them um, applied, but they neglected it. They stopped doing that they went back into bondage and we see the same language in in scripture you know he's purchased you with a he's bought you with a price therefore do not become slaves of men so like mass sand so so oh i'm good now i'm very faithful you know it's like (laughs) we have we have a good friend that we finally you know get to um uh serve god faithfully and we we just know this kind of person they they're very squiggly in, in what they do and and you know they they constantly doing diets and 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 stopping them and and working out and stopping them. So all right, they've we've they've made a, a profession of faith and they're serving God in faith. So I'm gonna like on the sideline hire a hitman and take them out. That way I know they're gonna go to heaven and not change their mind later. <laughs> that's that's so awful, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> right. Um. Yeah. So it's it can apply to anybody that question, and the answer is children, no. Right. G- g- the reason God sent. Christ uh, sent the son in the first place. The reason the father sent the son, I'm going to get that right, um, is because the son was supposed to purchase back the life that we lost, i.e. he's supposed to defeat death so that it doesn't happen anymore. So to, to say, well, then we might as well be for death to so that everybody ends up with God, That's you're, right. you're not thinking correctly. I mean, that's just not an option. Correct. Um, before we jump into the next one, do you want to do the meme, or do you want to hold off? Uh, we We're at 22 that. minutes. We can huh? end, end with that one, because it'll be fun. <laughs> <laughs> or it could be the mini if we uh, right. if we end up running over. Okay, let's, uh, then go ahead with uh, with Mike's. All right, so this is uh, was a long conversation with a guy named Mike, and uh, we started getting into the nature of man and some other things. Um, and he, he finds our position on the nature of man to be contradictory. And then he, he lists some reasons why. Um, first, he says, um, Adam and Eve were created as adults, which is very different than the rest of mankind. Um, so I guess his first three points here all relate to we've we've cited in the past that there is some. Uh, you could kind of see Adam and Eve as a shadow or a type or uh, what's the yeah, I think a shadow is right. Anal- a shadow of analogous. all spiritual people, or all uh, the right. state of all people spiritually when they're born. Right. right. Um, we've used that as, as a kind of a type, and, and he's basically attacking the the, the shadow and, and saying that it's too different. You can't use that kind of thing. And, and he first says, Adam and Eve were created as adults, which is very different than the rest of mankind. So, um, you know, they you can't use them in their pre-fall state uh, as compar- comparable to children, because that's what we've we've done yeah so let let me restate the relationship between adam and eve and children under the grace of god in a very basic way and then we can explain how we had the the subtleties or nuances that we've kind of changed just just based on his questions and poking at it um that helped us reform what it was we were explaining or how we were explaining it i should say and that, that that's really i think the benefit of uh, all his emails. He was very cordial for most of it <laughs> when he wasn't, when he got a little, you know, snarky, uh, we pointed it out. He, he immediately apologized. So it was a very pleasant conversation. Um, very thoughtful guy. And uh, he is a Calvinist um, and he was just, you know, pressing our idea, our, our view to see if it, it held water in his eyes. And that's fine. That's fine. Um, so the way we explain, the way we would explain now, the relationship between Adam and Eve and their pre-fall state and children is that prior to knowing good and evil, 
Adam and Eve were under the grace of God under and, and they were right in his eyes. And children, prior to knowing good and evil, are under the grace and mercy of God. Um, and, and that's kind of really where it ends because children do sin, um, they, but they, they don't comprehend it. They aren't prepared to comprehend it. And so God holds them, uh, does not hold them accountable for it. He allows their uh, ignorance to be um, paid by Christ and gives them grace anyway. Adam and Eve weren't sinning. They they didn't have any rules actually, so they only had one. And until they broke that rule, they were uh, free from sin. They weren't like children in that way. And also, children are ignorant. As in, I don't mean to call children dumb, but <laughs> but they just don't understand. Whereas Adam and Eve were created adults. They were um, cognitively more capable of understanding things than any child could be. And probably any adult at this point, I imagine they were, you know, far superior to us. Uh, there's been a significant downgrade over time. But, um, yeah, there, there are differences between the situation that Adam and Eve were in in the garden prior to their fall and what children are like. But as far as pre-good and evil versus post-good and evil, um, I think that still applies. Right, yeah, because it's, it, there's a, it says that when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that their eyes were opened, right? So they, something happened where they became more aware of, of um, responsibility, what just occurred with them and God, um, you know, what uh, that that this command that God had given them, you know, what it really meant. You know, they had this this complete and total understanding of what that meant. You know, and it says they were shamed and they were naked, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, and so prior to this, they're, they are in, in what seems to be some kind of ignorant state as well. They have mental faculty, but they still have ignorance, right? Um, you could almost point that to um, like the in Leviticus where it talks about sins of ignorance where, you know, these people, there's there's these laws, these written laws that God has, you know, don't touch somebody who has leprosy, right? Or don't touch a dead animal, right? A dead carcass where they they, they did this in ignorance and then they come out, come come to later the fact, realize what they did, right? And and now they become accountable for what they did. They weren't accountable prior to that. They were covered. Uh, Adam and Eve seem to be in this kind of state as well. Um, they, they once they ate of the tree, it, all of that, you know, <laughs> just all of this understanding of what just happened, what God said would happen has just happened. You know, I, I, my, their eyes were open to what just occurred. Uh, and, and we see that, that kind of, idea that um that construct happened with children where they they're growing they're learning they're 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 growing in understanding and mental faculty and they come to understand that they need that there is a creative universe that created them and, and they're here to serve him and faithfully and they don't do that they're now accountable right they've their eyes are opened kind of thing so that's kind of how we see how they're similar uh, and uh, i think there's something to uh, one thing that also that we talked about was, um, the definition of nature and where it's applicable. And I don't think he was buying that we, we use it contextually. If, if the context demands, uh, one, one definition of nature, uh, being, uh, the type of, uh, let's say the character that we're born with, that's our nature versus the circumstances and, and the decisions that we've made leading to a pattern of behavior, which is another definition of that Greek word phusis, um, being a second nature. That's what we'd call it today. It's a second nature. We've talked about, uh, military people when they go into the military, they, they have a certain nature. They're young. They're not molded the way that the military wants. They go through basic training. They have all this stuff beat into their heads and they come out with a second nature. Now they're waking up early. Now they're, you know, ironing their clothes a certain way and all this other stuff that they do. Um, they have, uh, that's not something they're born with, but it's still part of their nature. And so right. the Bible uses phusis in, in multiple ways. Um, and so what we were trying to stress to him is, yeah, it's contextual. Ephesians two, for instance, is a pattern of behavior. You are by nature, children of wrath. Yeah. Because you were far from him. You were all these things you were ignoring God and you were seeking after the lusts of the flesh. Therefore your pattern of behavior led to your nature being such that you are against God. Right. Okay, th that's fine. That, that, that makes more sense. Um, it, versus Romans 2, where he talks about the Gentiles could by nature do the things of the law. Well, that 
that can only really mean that he, what, what he's saying is this is something that was given by God. You can, Gentiles, do the things that are pleasing to God, which is, is, is his law, uh, which the law in their heart being their conscience or right. uh, following the Spirit's guidance. So um, different forms of nature are involved, and, and that's, that, uh, that understanding of nature was applied to children and, and uh, Adam and Eve. And we looked at, we talked a little bit about um, you, the you can, weakness of the flesh. Yeah, just to, I, I want to clarify that some more. Yeah, just go ahead. To, um, you know, I, you could look at um, your son um, and say, and somebody's like, oh, why does why does he uh, twitch his nose like that, right? And, and and Matt could be like, oh, it's his nature. I do, I've done the same thing since I was a kid, right? So th- it seems to be like a birth thing. He was born with this, like, this twitch in his nose that he does. Or, you know, somebody could say um why is why is he every time he comes in and uh his mom asks him something he says yes ma'am and and he opens doors and it's like um that's his nature he he's that's his nature to do that why is it his nature to do that because matt taught him how to do that and is ingrained into his brain now to do that that's the two forms of nature that scripture uses it's not always there's not always a static uh, it has to mean this always this etc there's the two ways that we see it Right. And there's also the, the fallacy of applying like all possible definitions to a word every time it's used. I can't right. remember what it's called, but that's wrong too. Um, but so yeah, th- thank you. Um, that is a work in progress with Isaac. We're working on the whole being a gentleman, holding the door open, <laughs> using manners thing. Uh, <laughs> uh, the struggle of parenting, right? Um, so looking at Adam and Eve, uh, in, in, in the nature that they were created with versus the nature that children are born with he kept going back to children now have a sin nature and i said no we don't get that that anywhere in scripture we're not told that they are born with a different kind of flesh than adam and eve and in fact we see adam and eve uh dim well eve specifically demonstrate the weakness of the flesh uh the lust of the flesh lust of the eyes pride of life when tempted by someone who's fallen right namely the serpent and I said, so consider the fact that we aren't told that there is any previous temptation from a fallen being prior to when Eve uh, succumbs to the temptation and they fall. And uh, the difference between that, a temptation-free existence for a while, and what a child is born into today, absolutely inundated by uh, death and temptation everywhere. I said, so... Kid, do we even stand a chance if they fell, Adam and Eve fell on the first temptation, does any child today stand a chance of not sinning? Absolutely not. They're going to succumb to, especially being young and not being able to understand good and evil, which is why God passes over them in the first place. Uh, they, they, they don't always comprehend, oh, this is right. What does right even mean? Oh, I should honor my parents because it's right, and right is rooted in God, and I want to please Him. That's not something they're capable of putting together. So when something comes up, and they say, and we say, "Don't eat that cookie," and they walk over to the counter, grab the cookie, and eat it in front of you, <laughs> that's just because they're kids who aren't, you know, they're not comprehending the full impact of their actions. Um, so we we don't believe that the nature of Adam and Eve is different than the nature of children, physically speaking. We believe that. Nowadays, we are born into a dead world, into right. a world full of sin, and the weakness of the flesh just has so many more opportunities to manifest. Let's uh, explore that just a little bit. So, um, John tells, I think it's John, he tells us that the lust, the lust of the, the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, um, these are of the world, right? So these, and, and these are the things that lead us into sin, those three things. And as Matt said, we see those same three things with 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 Eve and, and the tree. She sees that it's good for food. She you know she sees that it's good for food. It looks like it's gonna taste good, and and it'll make her you know, it'll open her eyes. All all three of those pertain exactly to um, those three things that John mentions. And to lust means to desire something that's forbidden, right? So Matt, what was the only thing that was forbidden for Adam and Eve? Don't eat. Don't eat, not don't touch. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right. That was the only, only thing in the entire universe that God said was forbidden, was was something that they could not do. So were they naked? Yes. Um, was that something that was forbidden? No. Could Adam look at Eve in all sorts of various thoughts? Absolutely. Um, and, and this is 
a little bit of philosophy here. What about what if what if they were to was lying an option with Adam and Eve prior to the fall? I think I think uh, anything was an option. We can't. Uh, yeah. I, so I've thought about this recently too. I mean, we we got to be careful what we speculate, but right. we can rely on the fact that God has states more than once um, through Paul and others that where there is no law, there is no accounting for sin. Right. So so if God said never said that skinny dipping was a sin, then they could go swimming naked all they wanted and they weren't breaking any rules. Right. It was fine. And we also see that um, there's only one command that they didn't have. Right. And that, that they had, which was don't eat of the tree. And we also see that the tree seems to be the knowledge of good and evil, that their eyes were open and they, and they now after eating understood that they were naked and they were shamed. So there was a difference in, in pre and post eating of the tree. Um, and I think that is, is it's it tells us something um, about what occurred, right? That there was now this understanding that, all right, now you, you had one thing that you're supposed to do, but now you you see everything possible that you shouldn't do, right? And that and everything possible that I desire for you to do. So you now now you now you have good and evil. You understand what good and evil is. You understand what I want you to do and what I don't want you to do. And it's it just got so much bigger. And all of us now are born in that that world of of it's so much bigger. Yeah, yeah. There's there's no escaping it. You can't you can't um, sequester a child away so that they don't experience uh, temptation and sin in some form or fashion uh, because they die. <laughs> you, they cannot survive being out of contact with humanity. It just doesn't doesn't work. My computer keeps locking up, so sorry if you hear a bunch of typing and stuff. It's driving me crazy. Um, and- he then pointed to, well, that seems to work with them, but what about like, you know, the the angels, right? They didn't have bodies, so and they fell. You know, they made the choice to fall. Um, they because we 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 say that it was the weakness of the flesh because that's the language that Jesus uses, Paul uses, etc. That we're not born with a sinful nature; we're born with the weakness of the flesh. And he says, well, what about angels? Angels didn't have, you know, physical bodies, so but they sinned and rejected God without any kind of temptation. Yeah. Real quick, before we get into angels, more on, on flesh versus spirit. We also see, I think it's in, I was in Corinthians first, first or second, I can't remember which, but he talks about um, being sown flesh and being raised spirit, being sown in weakness, going down in weakness, coming up in strength. And uh, there's, there seems to be uh, more strength uh, or being flesh seems to be um, inferior to spirit. Um, and, and and plus the other citations that you read as well, that the weakness of the flesh does seem to be a thing. And when we use that language, we're not making it up. That's just biblical language that we're, we're applying to these situations. So getting into angels, they're not flesh as far as we know, or they're not flesh in the same way as us. Mm-hmm. Um, so and Billy, my, my thought when I was thinking about this, and I don't think we ever actually, I didn't respond to it in the email because, because the, 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 uh, emails were getting so long. There were some things I had to ignore. And, and in the future, if you email us and you have a whole bunch of things you want to talk about, we, we do have full-time jobs. We do have families. We do, we do have wives who want to spend time with us occasionally. And we may have to pick and choose what things we respond to. Not that we're like just, you know, glossing over your other arguments, but you know, we, we do you, you have a little grace with us, be a little merciful. Um, we can't respond to everything. Uh, the, the Bible bro down Marco Polo group knows that full well. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Mm-hmm. Um, and gal. Um, but yeah, I, I think my first thought with this was angels are punished. Or God promises that uh, there is no explanation in Scripture of how angels will be redeemed. So their sin, for whatever reason, was more... Um, uh, it was more vile. It was, it was more profound... Mm-hmm. than the sin that we experience. And, and I, that's the, I don't know why they, I don't know why they fell. I mean, I can't explain that. I just know that they did, <laughs> you know, I, Braxton and Jonathan over at Trinity radio just kind of talked about this in one of their last episodes about how, you know, they, there's, there's definitely a difference between angels who were in the presence of God, right. And, and saw his glory yeah. to us who never, ever have that, right. There's definitely a difference. Likewise, you could also, um, see a difference in, you know, Adam and Eve both sinned, right? But it says that Eve was deceived. Adam wasn't deceived. 
who, and according to scripture, had the greatest sin, who was judged as, you know, the one who committed the greatest act against God, Adam, right? Because he wasn't yep. deceived. Um, so God is just, and, and we would all, uh, look at that, you know, if, if this was, you take this out of the biblical story and we see one person was deceived, one person wasn't just did it out of rebellion. We would see that, yeah, the person that did it out of rebellion deserves more punishment is more accountable. Um, that's just a natural, it's common sense. It's ingrained into our DNA, <laughs> uh, right? That justice. Um, and we see the same thing with angels. Um, they, they would have had, you know, we see, um, of the world, right? The, the less flesh, less of the eyes and the pride of life. Well, uh, they, they still seem to have eyes they still seem to be able to to see things because it says that they look upon men and all this stuff right that, that they, they they have eyes so they could have they could desire something that is forbidden right and then we have the pride of life well they could have pride because i mean if if we look at the um, ezekiel and isaiah passage that's often referred to as um satan right uh that we think that he had pride which is why he fell so they had eyes and and the, two of those things seem to be um, possible for them as well. Uh, and, and lastly, if you want to look at the like the lust of the flesh, and many people posit this is just uh, speculation that when um, an angel or a spiritual being takes on flesh, that they then are part of and and have uh, the the same traits that the flesh would have. Right? For instance, when when Christ took on flesh, he took on all of our weaknesses. The same thing can also be uh, is posited with angels. Like if they if they were to turn uh, form a body that's human, well, and they can now eat. They you know they can do all the things related to to humans as well. Yeah, the the, the temptations of the flesh and the pleasures right. that we experience. Yeah, that'd be tempting to them. Um, but yeah, ultimately we we can't know for sure. I, I think I think what you just explained, Billy, is as good an answer as we can offer. Uh, added to the fact that. There is no redemption, as far as we know, for angels. It was a worse sin that they committed uh, for the reasons you listed. So um, I, I don't think that angels being different impacts the the uh, case of Adam and Eve and children one way or the other. I think that the biblical language of the weakness of the flesh is still applicable to Adam uh, to Eve in the way that she's described as reacting to the temptation that was given to her. And it's still applicable to everybody else since then. Right. Um, and all the temptations that we face. So, yeah, I think that you see, um, it's something that, uh, just to add on to that, because we still have a little bit more time with children, you know, we, every parent, every person really, because everyone's around children sometime or another sees a small child, um, do evil, right? You know, lie, hit, punch their sister in the face, whatever, right? We see those things, right? Oh, so yeah. oh, obviously yeah. they can, they, they, and, and again, that, that seems to be of the world, right? The pride, the less of flesh, less of the eyes and part of life. That seems to be of the world, but we also see them, um, do what we would say is, is things out of like unconditional love, right? We see that with, uh, how they treat their parents. Um, you, you can watch things and see kids do these things and, and it just brings people to tears because it's just so pure, right? So there seems to be both, right? And that's what we see in Scripture is that they the, that the the knowledge of good and evil is within them because God has, has said it in them, right? But they but Scripture says that they can't discern between the two, and it says that also that they that they they've yet to reach the age to refuse evil and choose good. So they're doing these things without any mental comprehension, mental understanding, mental responsibility, that kind of thing. But we see both within them from the very beginning, and I think that's uh, important. Uh, because that it, it's once you come to understand and be be willfully um, accountable for what you're doing is when you start um, having judgment on you. And so how important then does it make it to train your children up in the way they should go? You talk about uh, me trying to teach Isaac to hold the door for people and to use your manners and to just be a, a gentleman. And if I ingrain that in him and it's his second nature that he just does this because he's been taught to do it, then hopefully my hope is that when he's older and he's old enough to just make his own decisions and, and I can try to <laughs> appeal to him to act the way that he should, but he's going to have to decide I'm going to continue acting in this way or I'm going to rebel and go do something else. Uh, and yeah, that's just, if we, if we teach them to fear God and to love God and to, 
seek his will instead of their own, now it will be less of a hurdle for them when they get older. Uh, does that mean that they'll definitely be saved and trust God? No, they could still say, I don't want all this. I'm going to take my life and I'm going to go squander it. And then I'm going to go hang out with some pigs. Mm -hmm. But hopefully uh, our equipping them now serves them well in the future. Um, going back to, uh, he, he mentioned some things about nature, about being, it being fuzzy and said, you know, natures are not chosen. And this goes back to, again, how you define nature. We would agree that some natures aren't chosen. Um, right. He, you know, he mentions genetics and environment and other circumstances, and uh, we have very little control if any to change our natures. It depends on which, again, which nature you're talking about. Uh, but uh, I change all the time. I, I go from bad habits to good habits all the time. We see people do this stuff all the time. We see people who, you know, have uh, had a nature to eat and eat and eat and eat and eat, and they become obese, uh, turn around and change their, their thinking and their habits and they end up losing weight and, and they look like, you know, the CrossFit dudes. Um, that's, that's changing. <laughs> that's changing your nature, right? We actually yeah. have the ability to change. I noticed that in that argument, I didn't bring it up. I don't think I remember. I don't remember bringing it up. I should say, um, when he is talking about the, uh, all these things contributing, um, he, he's he's coming at it from a very compatibilistic way. And I think he even is, is explicitly said that, uh, he's a compatibilist. And uh, so, uh, you know, put, put on my Calvinist hat real quick. Under compatibilism, you would say that uh, every, uh, all circumstances, so you're born with a certain nature, and then all the different circumstances in your life leading up to this very point have impacted you in a way that manipulates or that, that subtly changes your nature so that you are now currently who you are. Um, and this is very much like uh, a more naturalistic take on determinism, which is that it's just, uh, it's a, oh, I'm losing my mind here. It's a neurological determinism. You're born mm -hmm. this way, plus all of the circumstance in your life equal who you are now. And you're only going to choose the way your nature wants you to choose. Well, no, <laughs> sorry. That's, <laughs> it just doesn't work. I mean, that's, uh, I can choose now to go get a snack or I can choose not to. Um, I, I'm not inclined one way or the other. Uh, I finished my intermittent fasting today, so I really actually want to go get my snack, but <laughs> I'm not going to yet. Um, and, and someone listening to this who's a determinist would say, well, yeah, you're not going to go because you're in the middle of recording and you just said you don't want to, so you're not going to. And I would say, well, but I have the option and I could go get it. And so you get in this like weird, like whirlpool of, but I could, but you won't, but you could, but you won't. And like, um, what, what we have to go back to is what God says and what the Bible says, because philosophically you do end up in that trap. But what scripture says is that God desires for people to choose him. He's placed before them life and death and he wants them to choose life. He wants them to, to seek the spirit and to set their mind on him and to pray continually and not choose uh, uh, the flesh and not choose death and not go after the things of the world. Um, and he's not disingenuous. We have to just fall back on his character. We know that he is loving. He is fair and he is impartial and he is not going to be disingenuous with that offer and say, here, here's life, but I've manipulated your nature so that you won't choose it, even though you can. That's, that's just, that's just wicked. That's not true. Right. Right. It's, it's, Everywhere you look, uh, God is a, a God of justice and fairness and goodness and compassion and love, and and He doesn't. Um, uh, when when you are have, when you're totally unable to do something and and totally ignorant of something, He doesn't hold you accountable uh, for it. Again, like you said earlier, when there is there is no law, there is no violation. Um, that's one of the passages. Braxton has mentioned uh, one of the books recently about the guy who's defending compatibilism and, and talks about the the man with no arms. Right? Can he comp, can he climb the rope or whatever? Or, or I forgot what kind of analogy, but you know, commanding someone that doesn't have the the ability to do something uh, that's not something that God does, and then right, holds him accountable. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, um, my word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart. Why? So that you can observe it, right? That's why he gives it to us. That's why he gives us a conscience. That's why he gives us the knowledge of good and evil. That's why he sets life and death before us because we actually have the ability to choose. Dang, there was something else I wanted to say about that too. And and then I started thinking about the other questions that we wanted to talk about and I forgot what it was. <laughs> yeah, he uh, this um, 
I, I I'm pretty sure that Mike uh, is is reformed in his thinking. Um, yeah. With with our big long, he never said he was, but we got, and he actually started off for the first like ten or so emails. I mean, I I couldn't have told you he was reformed because he was just in that inquiry inquiry mode, right, where he's asking questions, which is amazing, which is nice, because um, you can you can tell that he was li- trying to understand our position, and. Um, he mentioned uh, after all this that there's a number of big problems with the idea that all children go to heaven. And he said, most theologians just admit that's a mystery, et cetera. Um, and I, I, I find that statement. I don't even know what to say. Impossible but. to prove. <laughs> yeah. Right. right. Well, and one thing, and the last, the, my last response to him, cause he mentioned um, these people with PhDs and these professors saying one thing versus another. And I said, look, You've got PhDs you can you can appeal to. I've got PhDs that I could pull up right now on Marco Polo and and say these people agree with me. Um, I said, and then as as Christians, we could look at a thousand times more people with PhDs out there who are suppressing the truth and unrighteousness and say that we're completely wrong. We can't appeal necessarily right. to those authorities and say I'm right because this guy says so because everybody has their own guy. So ultimately, we have to depend on the Spirit. And the word and uh, the conviction within us. Be be convinced in your own mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, fifty one minutes. I don't know. What do you do? You want to talk about uh, Romans thirteen? We can talk about the meme. I think the meme. Yeah, Romans thirteen will be the mini cast. Cool. All so, right. So <laughs> we had. So this is going to be a <laughs> Facebook question, and it wasn't actually in um, <laughs> our group, but it's still a question that we want to answer. Uh, Somebody says, oh, boy, how would you respond to James White? And it's a picture of James White, and it's a quote from him where he says, this is James White saying, I am offended personally by a proclamation of a Christ that can be, can't be can be a savior without our permission. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> old James White. I I want to say up front, I think he's a smart guy. I think there are some things that, that he does that uh, I really appreciate. Um, some of his work with Muslims and stuff. I know uh, some of our friends disagree with me on on giving him any credit for anything, but he's earned it. Uh, the the KJV only debate, uh, the Trinity, yeah, he mm-hmm. uh, against homosexuality and people who are trying to push that on the church. He, he's done a lot of good stuff. Um, we just disagree with him on Calvinism, which which he would say is like the basis for all of his apologetics. I would say God's the basis for all of his apologetics, not a certain soteriology. But you know, that's here or there. Um, this particular question though, is obviously soteriologically, <laughs> uh, or soteriological. And it is, um, a mis- misunderstanding of, of the other side. I think he's creating a false dilemma where you have Calvinism on one side, and then you have, uh, a begging, pleading God on the other side saying, please come, let me save you. And, and, uh, that's, actually not the right picture that's a false dilemma that's that's wrong that that second option is just not true so billy why is it not true um yeah so many people answer this question saying well that's just well scripture says that we have a choice so that's that's the answer um and i think i think it's a little bit bigger than that and a little bit uh, deeper than that um the, the uh, we see that um christ is the savior of all men uh, and as, as Paul says to Timothy uh, in, in 1 Timothy 4, it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance for it is for this we labor and strive because we have fixed our hope on the living God who is the savior of all men, especially believers. So, Matt, who there is Christ the savior of? Uh, all men. Is that, wait, is that all types of men or all men? Read it again. Of all men, especially believers. Oh, yeah. I guess it is all men. Hmm. Right. So um, this goes back to just like some fundamental foundational things that I think Matt and I, the distinctions that Matt and I have made in, in our in our teaching um, that we've kind of, kind of came to understand. Um, and, I, and I think it's a distinction that, that really can, if you understand it, can help you start seeing some other things uh, and see how big and wonderful God is, right? Um, he, that he, you know, he's the savior of the world. He, he died for all people kind of thing. Um, Christ is, by, by no one's choice, uh, uh, the savior of all men. And, and how is that possible? Oh, Matt? universalist heretic, you? <laughs> 
No, not really. Uh, <laughs> uh, keep going. Uh, sorry, I had to throw that in there. So, yeah, um, he is a savior of all men without considering their choice. And he's the savior of believers, too. And how, how are these two statements true? Well, I can give you an example pretty, pretty easily. Um, when uh, God freed the Israelites from Egypt, he purchased them all. He bought them all. He redeemed them all, right? Every single, every single Israelite, he, they were all, he was a savior of all of them. But yet, in, in the, the, he wasn't finished, right? The, he freed them so that they could serve him. And in the wilderness, some of them, uh, well, a lot of them, um, actually didn't serve him and ended up being judged and condemned uh, in the wilderness. Uh, some went back to their own bondage, etc. But only those that were faithful um, were saved and entered into the promised land. So he actually purchased and bought all of them. He was actually their savior. It wasn't a like a potential savior. He was actually their savior. He freed them from bondage. He they they weren't stuck where they were. They weren't stuck only doing um, this particular slavery. They actually could choose to do this or do that. And some chose to actually follow God faithfully, and he was their he was especially their savior. And they inherited eternal life, but some didn't, and they were judged and condemned after the fact. Yeah, here's another uh, image for you. So we know that salvation is like Noah's Ark. We get that from First Peter three. Um, we will pass through God's judgment by being in Christ, just like Noah and his family passed through God's judgment by being in the Ark. And so, picture, if you will. Uh, Noah's, uh, Noah and his family being on the ark for a much longer time. And as they're floating around, um, the Calvinist idea would be that, uh, as they're floating around, they see people out there floating and then, uh, they are going to, uh, arbitrarily pick which ones to float up next to throw a rope to and pull them into the ark. And those people get to be saved. Um, uh, what we're saying is that, uh, Ad uh, Noah and his family are having babies on the ark. And as these babies grow into young adults and they, they comprehend their option, some of them, though they are saved currently, they're all born saved, some of them, when they get old enough, decide, I think I'm just going to try and swim for it. Peace. And they jump off the boat out of salvation into the world where they die in the water. Um, what, what's interesting the, is that while they're out in the water drowning, that... The people in the boat are like saying, come back, come back, come back. They have a rope ready to throw them to right. get them back in the boat. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and what's what what people fail to understand is that this is how it is with, with Christ actually purchased everyone. You know, we are born under his grace. We are born like the prodigal son. We have an inheritance. He's purchased it for us. He's offering it to us, right? But but most of the world jumps. They leave. They jump out. Like in Matt's analogy, they jump out in the water thinking, I'm going to do this myself. I'm going to trust in myself instead of God, right? And, and I'm not going to serve him on this boat. I'm going to go, you know, I think I can, I think it's better out there. I'm going to go do that. Uh, and, and, and so they're out in the water. But and that's where most people are sitting as adults is sitting out in the water trying to do it themselves with with everyone else saying repent and come back repent and come back right uh, that's that's the analogy yeah you, you it, can it, you can come back onto the boat <laughs> just like the parable par, the parable of the prodigal son he's born in the house of a person who's taking care of him in every way he could want he decides at some point to leave this uh, ideal perfect place. And go into the world and and try his hand at living his life on his own. He ends up squ squandering his life. He wastes it. He does away with it. And he realizes the only way for him to continue to live is to get back to the person who was providing for him in the first place. He returns to his father's house. And he is he was dead while he was gone, but he is alive again. If, if people jumped off the boat, they were dead because they weren't going to survive out there long. But if they got back on the boat, they're alive again. Right. Yeah, it... it, it James White's uh, straw man there just doesn't fly. That's not the way that, that God speaks about his the atonement. He purchased everybody, and then people are going to rebel. He is not out there begging people to come join him in his salvation. He's not, you know, that's just not the way it works. He's he's made sure everybody is sufficient knowledge of him to remain with him. Yeah. It's like, um, I, I like the... The Exodus. Uh, I mean, that's a story that you, everyone can understand. You know, just in other ways, like you know, there's not this this the city where everyone in there is 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 saved and everyone outside the city uh, is unsaved. 
and and everyone you know everyone has to you're born out outside the city in, in condemnation in the desert and, and and life is rough and 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 you have to come in the city no you're the king has actually put everyone in the city and and, and said I, I promise you that if if you serve me faithfully that you're going to get these things right so they're born in that city and it's them leaving and departing and rejecting that and not believing that promise where they go on and, and, and they don't trust in what the king has said those are the ones that are condemned that's where the that's where the world is is that god has has, has done all these things and i, I like it's paul where he says consider the great things that he's done for you oh, is it in ephesians um i can't remember where it's at i wish i could right now um but i mean christ has died for you you can say that to everyone christ has died for you he's purchased you you have redemption serve him faithfully right don't go back to bondage right because that's what the Egyptians, or again, that's what the Israelites did. They went back to their bondage. They were freed, but they went back to their bondage. Don't be like that. Yeah, you, Recon you're, recognize the Creator, honor Him, and give Him glory. It's very much like Romans five. Uh, we explain this in our Romans five episode. You have uh, the sin of Adam being applied to everybody, but you also have the uh, the grace of God being applied to everybody through Christ, and then those who take hold of or, or, or grasp the free gift, uh, they will be justified. So you have people born under the salvation of God, under the grace of God. And then if they remain in it, if they cling to it, if they abide in him, as John 15 says, they will, they will uh, be saved at the end. And yeah, I like how you so, said it in, uh, in Facebook messenger, when we were talking about this, you said, you said, right. He has saved all, but allows people to leave. You know, it's like they, they make a conscious choice to leave versus he has offered salvation to all and some never come. Most people have an understanding right. of he's offered salvation to all and they never come. But we no, he's actually the savior of all men and you, you have to reject his provision. As, as, as Christ says, you blaspheme the spirit, right? The spirit is actually there to lead you and you say, no, I'm not going to follow you. And you blaspheme the spirit. Cool, man. Uh, that was four, well, like three questions and a, and a meme. <laughs> That's good. Uh, if they want to ask us more questions, I, I will say if, if you do email us more questions and um, we're, we're, we're doing our best not to read last names because we know some of you are closet non Calvinists and that's okay. Um, you, you have circumstances where maybe you don't want your last name read on the, on air. Will you please just tell us where you are? That way we can say uh, Susie from Ohio or whatever. Uh, uh, and you don't have to, if you don't no big, we just say your first name, but it just adds a little, little something, yeah. something. Yeah, you can ask so, us questions on our Facebook group under Bible Brodown. You can email us uh, to at biblebrodown at gmail dot com. Uh, you can actually join our Marco Polo group. Uh, you can just message us on Facebook, and we can add you to our group. Uh, we get questions there a lot. There's usually there hasn't been in the past few days, but usually there's a lot of questions and answers on that as well. Yeah, and and not just from us. There are other folks in there, that very very smart, very bright people. Um, who are ready to answer um, because like I said at the beginning, we aren't always available uh, just cause life. I mean, that happens. So uh, we do rely on our brothers and sisters in Christ to jump in. And the Facebook group is the same way. We don't know. I may like a, a Facebook post, but I may not have the, the opportunity to actually reply to it, but there's so many bright people in there. They jump in and give great answers. And so, uh, yeah, join converse. It's awesome. Yep. All right. Uh, Anything else? It, oh yeah. Um, if if you're listening to us, but you've never heard of the Trinity Commission, or you don't know of the other podcasts, please go listen to Trinity Radio with uh, Doctor Bra blah, blah, blah. Doctor Braxton Hunter, Doctor Jonathan Pritchett. Go listen to uh, Soteriology 101 with Leighton Flowers, Doctor Leighton Flowers, and then uh, Doctor Steve Gregg over at the Narrow Path. All of them are part of the Trinity Commission. They're all fantastic. Uh, different takes on Christianity and, and or different focuses, I should say. Um, so yeah, something for everybody and we are looking to do or to maybe bring in some new people, uh, we're still working on it, still trying to decide what that's going to be like and what topics they're going to cover and things. But, um, yeah, we want people to come to the Trinity commission and have kind of the full experience all at one time, uh, of uh, maybe you're into philosophy and you're going to go here and listen to this, ep uh, this podcast, or you're into to apologetics. You're going to go listen to Trinity radio, or you, you're really concerned about Calvinism. You want to make sure you got it right. So you're going to go listen to Leighton flowers, uh, Bible stuff, any, any kind of Bible stuff from, uh, uh, soteriology to flat earth. 
you come to Bible Bro Down. And then if you just want to, to know about like anything and see a dude answer random questions from all over scripture <laughs> thrown at him, go listen to Steve Gregg because he, he's a catch-all. <laughs> so uh, I think that's it. Yep, that's it. God bless. God bless.